Well, hello, kindred spirits. I know it's not Sunday if you're seeing this as it comes out, but for the next couple videos, I will probably be doing a weekday video so that I can get some things done in the yard during this beautiful warm weather we have, knock on wood, because last year on May 17th, we had over four feet of snow. But I wanted to get some things done and I wanted to share with you today a few things, including some things to look for before you go thrift shopping and I'm going to be answering some questions we had about the vanilla and I'm also going to be making the little chick eggs that I showed last week. So I hope you enjoy. So I am right now getting ready to boil probably just two eggs. I'm going to make the Easter chicks that I shared in my last video. I haven't done this since 2012, so I have no idea how they're gonna turn out. But what I'm gonna be doing is just simply boiling the eggs. And what I like to do is put in my cold water, then I'm gonna add some vinegar. The vinegar does help release the shell and I just looked actually when I was trying to see how much to tell you because I usually just eyeball it and they say a tablespoon per quart and I have a couple quarts here and I'm going to add a couple tablespoons but anyways it also says it helps harden the white of the eggs better which I didn't know that part so in this case that's what I want I want the egg well done so I'm going to do this for about 12 minutes I'm going to put them in bring it to a boil, and as soon as it comes to a rolling boil for about 30 seconds, I'm gonna shut it off, cover it, and leave them for 12 minutes. If you like them softer for a different recipe, it's usually nine to 12 minutes for an egg. So this is easy peasy. I'm just gonna add my vinegar here. And with the eggs, oh wow, look at this egg, it's really bumpy. I have, that's so weird, poor chicken. <laughs> I'm going to put in just two eggs and you want to make sure that they're covered so I'm going to add a little bit more water before I start this. My stovetop here. We're now at a boil and I'm going to cover it. Shut this off for 12 minutes. Okay we have the eggs have been sitting for 12 minutes and I'm now going to put them right into some ice cold water. I even have some of the ice here and I'm just going to scoop these out and if the shell cracks I don't mind. I'm not going to be using the shell for this project. I'm just going to pop them right in here and I'm going to leave them for about 15 minutes and I know me it will probably be even in here longer but that's okay. Once I peel them is when we're going to start making the chicks. So I'm going to let those sit and we're going to go over some other things. Well, Kindred Spirits, I had quite a few questions regarding the vanilla and I'm going to answer some of those questions. So I was asked if the vanilla that I've been sharing, the Sugarwood 1790 vanilla, I was asked if that was the same vanilla that I made last year. No, it's not. This vanilla I made end of November, early December that I know is gonna be sitting for a year. And I created this and made this up before I even knew I was going to be forming a partnership with Menlo Farms Distillery out of Kentucky. So this was just a really neat coincidence that I had just created this and I will be using this, mind you, or giving it as gifts for Christmas. And then what you can get at the grocery store, you can get larger bottles too, but this is the norm I always grabbed. These are one ounce bottles. So this is a huge difference also when you multiply the cost. This really isn't that different at all. Another thing I like about this is that we use a glass bottle that is reusable. Whereas these, they're plastic, you dispose of them, 
that's it. So my thoughts are, and I just realized we went to a black versus a gold. Didn't notice that, but this one fits a little bit better too. But what I like is that I can reuse this bottle for vinegar, oil, bath salts, really anything that I want to put into a pretty container and keep it here in the kitchen, in the bathroom, however you want to use it. If this is too big for you, absolutely. If you want to make your own vanilla, the recipe I did is on, I'll put it, I'll link it below. It's also on my blog, but this batch right here was over $80 to make between purchasing the Madagascar vanilla beans, the alcohol that was here, and then also the container. And then I had a couple questions if it's gluten-free. Yes, this is a gluten-free vanilla extract. Now I have a question for you. And this is not a trick question. I was at my mother's last week and I was telling her how I've been making some of her recipes and she was thrilled to know that some of you had been making them also, sending me photos and sending me your gratitude for sharing them and she loved it. So I was sent off with her box of recipes to see if there's any others that you'd like me to share. And I pulled a few out here in front of me that I'm going to let you decide majority rules of what I make within the coming weeks and then we'll go further, you know, then what was the second one, third and so on. And there's more in this basket. So I have a few things here that I'm going to mention and I'm looking forward to making all of them, but I like seeing them here because there's some that I didn't realize were my great grandmother's recipes too, Now, other than now that I'm seeing them. So one of them I thought was interesting. This is a salad dressing that is poppy seed and all she has here is very nice. And I have to call her and ask where this one came from because it looks like it's created for an army of people because it's using two cups of sugar, four cups of cottonseed oil, one cup of white wine vinegar, and then there's a, a few other things in here. But I never used cottonseed oil in my life. I don't even remember this being used in the house, but my mother assured me that she made it, but she must have modified it because we did not have a vat of poppy seed dressing. So I ended up looking up information about cottonseed oil because I wanted to make sure it was healthy. I didn't hear about it, didn't know about it. And don't shoot the messenger. This is info that I got from several different internet sites. Only one said it was bad for us, but then everybody went at that person who said it. So do your own research if you wanted to try cottonseed oil. But what I found out is that it is healthier than olive oil. And it also is heart healthy. It has something with the polysaturated, monosaturated fats, which may help lower the LDL in our cholesterol, which is something that I'm working on. And it's also a great source of vitamin C. And I am going to look for this particular cottonseed oil. It's probably been there in front of me and I just never noticed it. So we have an option of making a poppy seed dressing, a strawberry pie, which is using, uh, let's see here, frozen strawberries and jello, okay? Now, the easy bread pudding, I only have this out to remind me. This recipe is my favorite. I know many, many, many of you have made it because I've gotten photos and emails back. This is on my website. I also have a video, two videos actually. I'm gonna link that below. But what she has here that I don't remember her making, she assures me she did, stove top bread pudding. So this is using a double boiler. I don't know. It's, this is one of those has a lot of extra steps, but if you want to see me make a stovetop bread pudding, we'll do it together. Coconut balls. This has dates in it and eggs and sugar. Oleo. I haven't heard the word oleo in forever. It's like a margarine. And there was also one here with Crisco. I haven't used Crisco in a long time too for pie crusts. Then I have a fresh apple cake. And this, this is good. And you actually, this has in here, let me see here, salad oil in it. So maybe we'll use the cottonseed oil. I'll probably use my olive oil, 
but this, this also has a lot of moisture to it. Hermits, can't go wrong with hermits. And then I have two soups, uh, cream of broccoli soup, which I guess is from my aunt. And then this is my great grandmother's corn chowder. And what I love is my grandmother's handwritings here. And it says mom's recipe, which I love. So this, this, is a, this was a staple in my house. So if you like any of those, comment below. And the one with the most votes is what I will make next. All right, so now I need to go check on those eggs and we'll start getting those ready to make the deviled egg chicks. I forgot one of the other questions that I got and it is regarding what is the shelf life of this vanilla because a couple people wanted to get it, wanted the bottle, wanted to support and thank you so much for that. But once again, it's indefinite and if you do purchase it, you just don't wanna have it in bright sunlight because it might um, take away a little bit of that flavor. So now I'm going to just prep for my little chickadees and what it calls for black olives and some carrots for the beak. Now I only had green olives and I was like darn it because I wanted to show you but then I realized I had a Greek feta salad in my fridge so I took out one of the olives. Now when I previously made it I had a can of black sliced olives, which made it a lot easier. But we're gonna go with this one for now. I'm gonna eat that one. I love olives. Now with the carrots, I'm gonna make a couple because once I see the chick, I wanna see the size that it's made. I, mean, I gotta finish this, this is rude. <laughs> okay, so I would probably make the chicks first and you'll see how big they are because you don't wanna have a little tiny beak on a big chick or vice versa. No chick wants that. So I'm gonna just cut a few things here and I'll do a little close up, but I'm gonna do kind of a little point to start with one and you can make a single, you can make it like two and I'll probably get another olive just so I can do the close up for you. But you just wanna have a, a, you know, a small little square to make eyes. Oh, I gotta sharpen my knife here. I usually like to do this with a little bit of oil, but it has olive oil in it from the olive already. <laughs> Just wipe this off. Once again, I'm trying to not make sure my hand's not in the way here, but also I'm just really just making tiny little pieces. These might be too big for the eyes. I'm not sure yet, it might be too small. And then for the beak, I'm just doing a small slice. And this carrot is very tiny. It might be easier to start with a larger one. And I'm just going to make like almost like a pizza shape, a pizza slice. And that's the, the, the beak that will come out. Now, if I wanted to do two, which I'm not sure, I don't remember what I did in that photo. I'll have to look again, which is kind of grainy. That was pre really good cameras for cell phones. But if I want to maybe do two beaks, let me see, how would that look from the top? That would be two pizza slices. And I'm gonna to try to make them the same size. If you're making a lot of these, you might wanna give yourself some time. <laughs> So if you wanted to have two beaks, you could do it like this. Okay, here they are, moment of truth. Let's see. And since this little chick is mainly wearing a hat, and the base is where a lot of the yolk is going to go. I'm going to cut off just a little bit of the top. Should probably look at my photo. I'm gonna to have to polish up my baby spoon because I'm actually shocked. I've used it three times in the past month. I just love the size of this for little projects. 
white. So I'm just now going to put the yolk, trying not to break the white here, and I'm just going to set this aside. Now you can make this deviled egg mixture however you would like. My daughter made one recently that really came out delicious. I'm going to see if I can find hers. Um, but right now I'm just going to make this up really fast with a little bit of mayonnaise, a little bit of mustard, some salt, some pepper, and I just go from there when I'm making it. Because once again, this is going to turn into a sandwich for me as soon as I make this. All right, so I'm just going to set these aside. All right, so once again, if you have a favorite way of making deviled eggs, would love to know. Comment below. I'm just gonna do this up nice and fine. And I don't know if I need to do an overhead shot. I've just literally just kind of pressed the egg yolk with my fork. And I'm just gonna add a little mayonnaise and a little mustard so that it holds together. I'm not following any particular amounts here. I'm going by eye. A little salt, a little pepper. Yeah, let's see. Let me just I'm add a little more mayonnaise for myself. And if you want the yolk to be brighter yellow, you can use just a regular mustard. I ended up using kind of like a spicy mustard. This is going to be a very tiny sandwich. I'm, I should have made a few more <laughs> eggs for myself, but that's okay. Okay. I should have read my own recipe to see if I used extra eggs for the yolk, but we're going to go with this. So I'm going to put it here in the base. I'll start with one. And chicks have little fluffy feathers, so I'm trying not to smooth it out too much. I'm going to add a little bit more. This chick's a little bit crooked. And then I'm going to put the little hat on. And then we'll put an eye. Another eye. And I'm just going to do one beak for now. You might have to up. We need, we need some support here. I'm going to use this little cup. Um, I had my last grouping that I when I made these in the egg carton. No, nope, he does not want to stand up. He is he's going in the sandwich first. You're the first to go. That's all there is to it. I'm going to prop him up with a carrot. Oh, the things I do for you kindred spirits. Uh, uh, okay. Yes? No? Yes? <sighs> all right, I have no idea what it looks like. Oh. He might have had a little bit too much of the vanilla or the bourbon himself. All right, this was the concept. I'm gonna let you run with it and do your own thing. But this guy is going in a sandwich because he is being fresh. He does not want to stand up. Ugh. You're ready to go thrifting. You're ready to go to consignment stores. You're going to an antique store or full price retail, whatever it is. I have a few tips that I'd like to share with you. And this comes from many, 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 way too many years of experience when it comes to shopping for furniture and accessories. Now, one of the most important things I like to do is I have a book with me that I travel with that's left in my car. And that has in there measurements, colors of my room and things like that. So let's say I'm going out furniture shopping or I find something I didn't know I was going to be looking for and at the last minute I'm like, what is the size of a room? 
there are times that I have called home and asked Ben to measure something that I didn't have in my book. So what I would suggest is go around your house and measure all of the doorways. You want to have not only the width, you also want to have the height. And believe it or not, I would even do at a diagonal because some furniture will fit through doorways certain angles and some furniture won't. I have had clients get things to their home and they don't fit up the stairways. They don't fit through any of the doors. I've seen movers have to take windows out, things like that. Now, if you know you have small doorways, go ahead then and start measuring windows for larger items if you can take those out. And I know that sounds over the top, but trust me, if the piece is something that you really, really want and you're trying to figure out a way to get it in, sometimes it has to be through a window. So I go around my house and I measure spaces. So over here, my mantle. So this mantle over here, it's been very plain for a couple years. I've had some flowers here when I decorate it for Christmas, but I just haven't found the right piece because it is only four and a half inches deep. Now I do have that beautiful copper piece that I got from my mother-in-law and I did dried flowers in it last year. It fit perfect. If you're looking for something that has a really unique small size, best to measure that. Now luckily, the two pieces I bought last week fit my mantle perfectly and there's no problem getting them through the doorway for sure. But I wanted to introduce you to, I have finally named them, Frickin' Frack. Many of you know I named things in my house. I have no idea why. And that's the first thing that came to mind. So Frickin' Frack are now going to find a home on the mantle next to Miss Pierce. And that's her real name. So luckily, these little guys are very shallow. And they fit on this mantle perfectly. Wait a minute. Let me swap this up here. Silly me. There's my little bit of my dyslexia. They fit perfect. They finally have a home here at Sugarwood. And Miss Pierce, you make sure they don't get into any trouble. Now I mentioned I keep a book in my car. I actually went out to get this so I could show you. And in here are a lot of the colors that I use. Now this is one that I did when I lived at Groton. And I have some fabrics and some colors that I like. There's my B wallpaper. But when I'm out and about, I love to keep in mind will it work in my home if I find something I love. So each page has some inspiration photos and then actual items. So here's my butler's pantry and the paint colors and then the B wallpaper. And I also have the Prescott green, which is the color of our past house. I'm not sure if I showed it, but this is also the color I did paint the door coming into the kitchen from the porch. And then I have what's in the hall right now, and then the library room with the color Village Green. And of course, the tavern wallpaper, the paint colors. So when I'm out, I know that something will or will not work with the colors. I, as you see, I even have Queen Bess and pictures of the stool, just so that I have a really good idea of what I'm looking for. And then I have some inspiration photos in here as well. Now it's funny, I've had this in a book. We had this exact chair in ottoman. This ottoman right now is actually in the living room being used as a little table in front of the sofa. But I liked this just because of the colors and whatnot. So I'm out and about, I can look for items that would work even on my mantle. This is a good thing to have or put together. It can be put in a little small photo album book. It could go inside a binder. It could even be some samples in an envelope, whatever it is. But if you keep it in your car, you'll always be able to run out if you find maybe a carpet you like or art or painting. Another thing I like to do is I call this my Neffle style lookbook. This has been put together over the years that I really like the looks and the colors. So once again, when I'm out and about, this helps me stay focused on things that I'm looking for. This is all of the styles and the looks that I like. You know, this is even one of the restaurants that is in Groton and I just loved the colors of the green, black, white. And this helped me pull together my past kitchen. 
So having something like this even before you go shopping so that you kind of stay on your desired theme or look that you would like for your house so it's a little cohesive. I decided to share these. These are notes that I wrote a couple years ago and I came across them. They were actually meant to go into whatever future book that I do. But there, there's just a few here, but I thought I would share them with you. Now I'm going to just really look at this quickly. Things to consider when thrifting and consignment shopping. So one of the things is don't be too strict of what you're looking for because usually an item that you weren't even thinking of will pop up and it's something you might want to consider. Also, if it's something that you've been looking for and you weren't prepared to buy it at that point, see if the shop will hold it with a deposit, see if they have a layaway program. And if they don't, and it's something you've really, really been waiting for, at that point, ask yourself, do you want to spend the money on something like that? And is there something you can let go in your home and maybe sell? to take its place. We all have different needs, desires, and wants, and it's what's gonna work for you and for your home. When you're heading out, ask yourself, am I gonna look for things that are in pristine condition, or am I willing to repair it, fix it, paint it, strip it, anything? You know, if you want something that you can just pick up and put in its place, that's one thing, but you'll find something maybe that needs a lot of work at a lot better price but it's gonna be some elbow grease going in and some sweat equity. Get to know the shop owners or employees because a lot of time you can say to them first, do you have a wish list? And a lot of times these stores do have wish lists and you can ask them to keep note of what you're looking for or if something comes in, they'll email you, call you, send you a text picture. I do get sent texts every once in a while with photos of things that I am looking for. Check over each item thoroughly before purchasing or paying full price. Now you might look at something and it looks perfect and I've done this many times. Sometimes I've even got it home and I didn't look at it close enough. But it could be as simple as when you're looking at the foot of a piece of furniture, there could be a little gouge or something's missing. It's not perfect. And you might want to say to the consignment store owner or the thrift shop owner, can you do a little bit better price? And I should say, or you can say, can you come down a little bit? Because at my store, when people ask, can you do a little bit better on the price? I, my response was, I can always raise the price. And then they would say, no, can you lower the price? So it was kind of my joke, broke the ice, and I usually did. There are so many reproductions that are made to look like antique, and it can fool even antique dealers. So on like the bottom of porcelain items, if it's perfect and not a lot of wear and tear, one, it was either in storage for its whole life, or it could be a reproduction because a lot of pieces you wanna have somewhere on the bottom. You wanna see that it was slid across shelves and cross tables and things like that. So I have here, if you pass an item in a store and it not only grabs your attention but pulls at your heartstrings, you might want to consider, is this an item that comes home with me now? The mule chest that I have in the dining room, in the corner cabinet I have in the dining room, those are pieces I looked at, I walked out, and then it was in a day or two. The store shut down for over six months due to vid. And I waited six months to wait for that store to reopen, to go back, measure and purchase the items and luckily they were still there but if i had purchased them on that day i would have had them in my house for those six months to enjoy so it's something can you buy it now once again it's going back to is it something that you do really want are you willing to lose it is it something that is perfect for the spot is it unique is it something that you're not going to come across a lot and oh my gosh is this fire hot behind me <laughs> with the black pants. Anyway, um, I'm gonna move a little bit. If you're traveling about and you know you're shopping, what if you find something large? Have you considered how are you gonna get it home? Do you have a truck or a trailer? Do you have a friend that has a truck or a trailer? Do you have a moving company that you can call locally just to come and pick up one large item? What will they charge? And does the store offer some sort of delivery program? That's always been something that has held me up from purchasing some large items. So have a plan if you're looking for big things. If you're looking for smalls only, you might wanna bring a box, some bags, some wrapping materials. It makes it a little bit easier for you to get things home. And if you're shopping out and about, um, you'll have things safely 
in the back seat of your car. I even like to bring boxes and baskets if I know I'm gonna be doing a lot of smalls so then I can put them in nice and safe. Sometimes asking the shop owner if they have any information. A lot of times a person will give them an item on consignment or thrifting and they will share the story of that piece. And it's always so nice to have that background story. And if not, you can always make your own, such as Horatio Haskell. We pretend he's an ancestor, but we have no idea who he is. I have a feeling that it was some sort of banker. I don't know. Now, if you're asking for a better price and the shop owner will not budge in that price, ask yourself, is it worth it? Is it something that you really want? Is it something that is priced right and the shop owner has already brought the price down and just can't budge? Because keep in mind, they're there also to make a living and they might have to share some of the selling cost with the owner of that piece or if it's thrifted, once again, they need to make an income to pay their utility bills and employees and things like that. So keep that in mind. And if it's something you really, really, really want, is it worth that price? And if so, I would say, grab it at the price as long as it's not way overpriced and that they're trying to stick it to the consumer. So, and some of the things is looking at a piece very, very carefully for cracks, for chips, missing pieces. And in some cases, I purchase items for what I will call top shelfers. If I've been looking for something and the price is really good, let's say a few dollars and it's this beautiful bowl, if it has a chip on it and I know I'm going to use that bowl, let's say on a top shelf or on a bookshelf where that little chip won't be seen, I will most likely purchase it if it's a good price. Now, if I'm looking for something that I know I'll be using, I will not buy anything that has a chip, a crack or a break because I want it structurally sound but also I wanna be proud of that piece. And usually those are priced a little bit higher. And since I also am in the business of resale, I'm always making sure I'm picking something that is in wonderful, perfect condition. But I've been known, once again, to buy things that are broken or chipped, because I will use it for flowers, display, holding items. And if it's not seen or if it doesn't bother me and it's not going to be something that food will be in, that you know breaking could be an issue, I will sometimes pick that up. Now in my home, I can easily say almost 90% of everything in my home is thrifted. Now, do we need to thrift? I am lucky to say that we do not need to thrift, but I have been thrifting my whole life. I love thrifting. I find it challenging. It's exciting. It's like hunting and you're looking for a certain piece and if it's gonna show up. I am searching for a cup and saucer to match my set. And yes, I can buy it online. I found it, it's there. But the fun is me going out and looking and going through these shops and looking in boxes and behind things for that special item. I mean, there are so many other things to consider when it comes to thrift shopping and consignment shopping. So I hope that answered some questions. There are so many more things to cover. And if you do have some questions regarding thrifting, consignment shopping, antiquing, please comment below, ask, and I will try to revisit some of that in a future video. Another thing I like to do when I'm out and about, I'm looking for maker's marks. I'm looking to see if there's anything that says made in versus just where it's from. Because if it says made in, it's a newer piece because they had to do that by a certain date. So if I see something that says made in England, it's newer. If it says just England, it's an older piece. And that helps me start with my research. If there is a maker's mark, I can sometimes take a photo of it and Google will help find that. Or I will just you know put a description in. I also have many books on my shelf that shows maker mark. And also, I do turn to the internet a lot for my research, and you're gonna find a lot of different pricing on the internet. You have some people who are just wanting to get rid of a piece, and there's no monetary value to them, so they just sell it for a lower price, or they might not know the value. And then you sometimes have the same item shown for a higher price, and it could be somebody that knows the, the value to it. It might be very important to them and they're not willing to let it go for a lower price, or they were just trying to be in a market for selling it and hopefully make a profit. And I also wanna mention that if you're not into thrifting and consignments, but you only like to do antiquing, remember those antiques used to be new items. 
and you could be purchasing a future antique if you thrift and consignment shop now. So I hope that answered a few questions for you. If you chose to wait till Sunday to watch this, thank you. I probably will be following along with you answering some questions on Sunday as well. But for now, kindred spirits, I will see you soon. Bye now.